Good morning. Um, as everyone's settling down, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and for um, withstanding yesterday's torrential rain and wind. But as you see, the clouds have parted, the skies are blue, and I think it's a great indication that today is going to be an extraordinary day and we are kicking off with what I think will be quite an interesting and stimulating conversation. Thank you very much um, for making the effort to be with us. My name is Tony Verstandig, and I chair the Middle East programs at the Aspen Institute. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Aspen Institute, it's an organization dedicated to fostering leadership based on enduring values to providing a nonpartisan venue for generating ideas, to address critical issues such as driving innovation and competitiveness in the global economy. I think last night, um, for those who were able to join uh, us last evening, Ibrahim Ajami uh, really was set the tone so beautifully uh, with his welcoming remarks. And I want to give him a very special thank you. He uh, reminded us why we were here and um, how the, the importance of translating ideas into reality on the ground and recognizing that in only a few short years, the forest has turned into a fab. And those of you who are gathered here today are about translating ideas into reality. That doesn't mean that there isn't a, uh, a long road ahead of all of us, but what it means is there is a deep and abiding commitment to transformational change, to recognizing an incredible partnership between the United States and the uh, United Arab Emirates to catalyze innovation that drives transformational economic growth. Both of our countries feel the urgency of investing in the human capacity, infrastructure, and ideas that will allow us to be at the cutting edge of the global economy our Emirates program, which I chair at the Aspen Institute, seeks to advance that common vision. I spend every day, Ibrahim said to me this morning, do you ever stop? And frankly, having the honor and privilege of working with my colleagues in the Emirates, I really try not to stop because it takes a lot to stay just a nanosecond uh, ahead and uh, thinking about some new ideas uh, to help create new stakeholders and new partners. In fact, the leadership of the Emirates have committed themselves to transforming their economy over the next two decades into a diversified, fully diversified economy that is invested in multiple sectors that will drive the, their future economy, create growths, and have sustainable jobs. The Advanced Technology Investment Corporation's investment in global foundries is a testament to the UAE's commitment to executing this vision and the belief that the semiconductor industry holds tremendous promise as a catalytic economic sector. No doubt, one of the critical issues of our time is the changing landscape of the American manufacturing sector and its role in the global economy. We recognize that American manufacturing is at an inflection point, but we also know that it has the potential for incredible growth in the coming decades, particularly in the areas of advanced and semiconductor manufacturing that features prominently in this region. Accordingly, our program and the Institute's Manufacturing and Society in the 21st Century program, directed by my colleague, Tom Dusterberg, have teamed up to spearhead a global conversation on the next generation of advanced manufacturing launched here today in Saratoga Springs, New York. We are honored to be a part of today's event, as well as to celebrate the unique international partnership that exists between the United Arab Emirates and the United States in particular in this important corridor of Saratoga Springs, Malta, and Albany. New York State has been on the cutting edge of translating 21st century ideas into reality on the ground. We stand here today at a juncture of a meaningful public-private partnership that is not only a vision, but an evolving reality, a new technology regional cluster that has attracted investment, 
and holds the promise for transformational growth for American manufacturing. Why here? This region offers the key ingredients, I believe, of a highly educated workforce, research and development capacity, and academic centers, all creating a synergy and a high-tech magnet. The Emirates-Aspen Partnership is at the nexus of advancing this global dialogue on manufacturing and the synergy between education, technology, jobs, and policy. Before I recognize my colleague Tom Dusterberg, I would like to uh, thank and, and also recognize Ajit Manchoa, the CEO of Global Foundries, and I have previously recognized uh, Ibrahim. Both Ajit and Ibrahim have been extraordinarily supportive of advancing not only ideas, but in reality on the ground. As Ibrahim said last night, in, it was only in 2009 when he looked around this upstate New York corridor, he saw a forest, and yet today we are seeing a fab. I also would like to congratulate uh, um, Ajit's new appointment. Uh, President Obama appointed him to the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, uh, um, it, excuse me, the Advanced, the President's Commission on Advanced Manufacturing, in what I believe is a clear recognition of Ajit's leadership and his, uh, in this very, very important industry. For those who would like to tweet, since we are in a technology environment, and I'm not sure many in this room would tweet, but today's conversation I think would be worthy of recognizing and stimulating an ongoing conversation. The hashtag is USMFG. So now it is my pleasure to introduce my Aspen Institute colleague, Tom Dusterberg, who is um, highly acclaimed and recognized in the field of American manufacturing. In particular, he has published, which all of you have, his recent report on the issue of um, 21st century manufacturing uh, and, uh, and the recognizing new technologies in American manufacturing. He will uh, provide some remarks and a scene setter for our policy discussion this morning. Tom? Well, let me join Tony in thanking uh, Global Foundries and ATIC for uh, supporting us and putting together this timely discussion. Holding this event here in Saratoga Springs is a unique opportunity to highlight current efforts here in the United States to create advanced manufacturing hubs. One tangible example being Global Foundries Fab 8 nearby in Malta. The uh, overall theme of our program today is the manufacturing resurgence with the vital components of partnership, partnership between companies, between countries, between business and the public and the educational sectors. All of these forms of partnership are exemplified in the remarkable facility nearby in Malta, which would not have been possible without these linkages. Uh, in many ways, the appointment of Ajit to the President's Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Steering Committee recognizes the leadership of global foundries in building partnerships to advance modern manufacturing. Let me say just a few words about why we care about manufacturing both in America and in the UAE. After all, as one uh, all too famous economist whose name I won't utter here today put it, potato chips or computer chips, what does it matter? Well, first, because manufacturing still is the backbone of modern economies, especially the advanced digital manufacturing we now have in upstate New York. This sector is a source of good jobs with good benefits. It generates more jobs and activity outside the sector than other areas like services. It still is a source of great productivity growth uh, through which a competitive edge in the global economy uh, is maintained. It is a driver of productivity growth in other sectors via the transmission mechanism of digital tools. It is the dominant force in global trade and investment, and it is the source of three-fourths of the research and development performed in the private sector in the United States, and thus uh, the lion's share of patent, patenting activities and innovation in the United States and around the world. 
In our fast-moving global economy, where technology changes at the speed of Moore's Law and the new, uh, new competition enters the market each year, excellence in advanced digital technologies is a key to staying ahead of the competition and increasing our standards of living. In this 21st century environment, no single company and increasingly no single nation can go it alone and expect to remain competitive. That is why partnerships of the sort we see in upstate New York are so crucial to the success of the economy. Without the contribution of the state of New York in providing the infrastructure, the trained workforce, and the skilled engineers and scientists needed for technology leadership, without the research collaboration of Semitech, the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, and the Global 450 uh, Consortium, and the, universe, the great universities of uh, New York, including RPI and the State University at, at Albany, which houses the uh, nanoscience facility. Without all of these, it would be difficult for global foundries and its partners to keep a step ahead of global competition. Despite the strong ecosystem for manufacturing in the United States, uh, capital investment, I would uh, note, has been weak in recent years, and the partnership between ATIC and Global Foundries gives a great shot on the arm uh, to building technological uh, excellence, including the vital element of co-locating production uh, with research and development facilities, which is so vital to making sure the great ideas spawned in labs and universities can be perfected and commercialized. Fab 8 is a key contributor to the manufacturing resurgence we can see in, uh, emerging in the United States, and which Tony mentioned um, I've uh, recently written about. Uh, besides technical excellence, other contributors to this resurgence, in my view, include the great energy renaissance here in the United States, which gives us a major advantage since it keeps prices low and supply abundant for a sector which uses uh, uh, about one-third of all the energy consumed in the United States. Um, the high productivity level of U.S. plants, which in turn is driven by deployment of digital technologies, um, the convergence of cost structures in the world, which reduces the advantages of low labor countries, a good supply of trained scientists and engineers, along with the technical workers to man the, the facilities, a good financial system willing to take risks, a growing sense among corporate leaders that producing closer to home brings major cost and logistical benefits. And finally, the openness to change and entrepreneurial risk taking, taking long characteristic uh, of the United States of America. Now, we at the Aspen Institute have offered an econometric study, which I just mentioned, to quantify what a manufacturing resurgence would, would look like over the next decade or so. Um, and I believe this report is available to all of you here today. Um, without going into uh, detail, I would only note um, that in our optimistic scenario in our modeling, again looking ahead to the year 2025, manufacturing could increase its share of the economy to almost 16 percent of total output compared to the 12 percent uh, it is at today resulting in GDP levels that are about $1.5 trillion higher than they would otherwise have been, with a generation of 3.7 million additional direct jobs in industry and personal income, and personal income ahead by 200 billion. And those direct jobs in turn generate a, a, a fair number of jobs outside the industry, somewhere perhaps on the order of five jobs for every one, if you're looking simply at the uh, high-tech production jobs. Um, importantly, outlays for capital investment in equipment and software, which again is a key component of productivity growth, would be about 12 percent higher, um, and our long-time trade deficit would be reversed. In our uh, modeling, we see a 7.5 percent annual growth rate in the export of semiconductors and a 13.6 uh, percent annual growth rate in the uh, export of computers and peripherals. Of course, it would take an improved policy environment to make sure this optimistic scenario is realized. And unfortunately, uh, today, as we view what is going on in Washington and to a lesser extent what's going on in Europe, uh, we uh, come to appreciate this even more. 
Such an improved policy environment, in my view, would include more stable fiscal and monetary policy, improved access to foreign markets uh, through trade and investment agreements, better tax and regulatory policy, continuing improvement in our schools for science, technology, engineering, and math skills, and a better focus and increased funding at the federal and state level for basic research in the physical sciences and engineering, which are so important to excellence in manufacturing. The types of creative partnerships we see here in upstate New York, especially between academia and research institutions and the private sector, are also key to future success. And our distinguished panel, which is going to come to the uh, um, stage in just a second, will have more to say about the policies needed to improve the competitive environment and ensure the continuation of this resurgence. So if I could invite our panel to come to the stage. Um, again, our topic this morning is one that uh, raises many important questions about the way forward. And I'm very pleased uh, that we have a distinguished panel of speakers to address them. I'm delighted to introduce uh, James Bob Haggerty of the Wall Street Journal, who will serve as our moderator for the panel discussion. Bob has covered the manufacturing sector from the great city of Pittsburgh uh, for the last eight years. And he has had a 30-year career uh, at the Wall Street uh, Journal, including many uh, exciting foreign assignments. So, Bob, thanks for being with us. Thank you. I'd like to just uh, briefly introduce the panelists. Uh, we have uh, Joanna Duncan Poitier, who has perhaps the most important job here. She's responsible for training all the people who are going to be needed to work at global foundries and other advanced manufacturing uh, businesses uh, in this area. She's senior vice chancellor for the community colleges and education pipeline at the State University of New York. She's also a native of New York City. Uh, we have at the end there uh, Dan Hutchison, who is chairman of VLSI Research. That means he provides information and analysis about the semiconductor industry, uh, especially the economics of that industry. He was born in Newfoundland, but he's uh, now a resident of Silicon Valley. Uh, we have uh, David Shavern, a native of Pittsburgh, uh, who is uh, executive vice president and COO of the US Chamber of Commerce. And he has uh, both a uh, law and an MBA degree and he's worked at the Export-Import Bank. And finally, we have uh, Eric Newhouse, who is Senior Vice President for Policy and Government Relations at the National Association of Manufacturers. Uh, before taking that job, he had more than 11 years of service on Capitol Hill, so he can explain to us why our government is so dysfunctional. <laughs> without necessarily taking uh, responsibility for that. Uh, before I turn it over to the panelists, I'd just like to make a couple quick remarks. Uh, it used to be that uh, Americans considered manufacturing to be a pretty boring topic, uh, which may be why I was assigned to write about it at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but I think there's now a consensus, uh, as Tom pointed out, that manufacturing is really very important. Uh, and there's an understanding that we can't just sit here and dream up iPhones and send them to China to be manufactured. Um, so, and there, there's a lot of optimism now that we're going to have a resurgence in manufacturing. Um, and certainly there are some encouraging trends, uh, which Tom was uh, enumerating for us. Uh, many global manufacturers have decided that they want to produce closer to where their customers are so they can respond faster to shifts in demand and they can lower their inventory and shipping costs. Second, as pointed out, the shale gas boom is giving us a cost advantage in natural gas. I don't think we're gonna keep all of this advantage here in America, but we'll keep some of it. Third, Asian wages are rising very fast. Ours aren't. So the old wage, uh, chasing cheap wages around the globe, that, that era may be coming to an end. Uh, the gradual rise of the Chinese yuan means that manufacturing in China is less compelling than it used to be, if your customers are in America. 
And there are other trends, but we can't just assume that these positive trends are going to do the trick and lead to healthy growth in manufacturing employment. China, India, Brazil, other emerging markets are all growing faster than we are in the US. So big companies are still going to want to move more of their production and their intellectual property to those places to serve those huge populations. And Asia's strengths are not limited to low-cost labor. China, Korea, Japan have all built up sophisticated manufacturing skills and supply chains that we have lost. The US also suffers from short-term corporate thinking, the focus on quarterly results, and that inhibits our long-term investments. And of course, we suffer from gridlock in Washington, an inability to deal with vital legislative issues, including tax reform, health care costs, and immigration reform. Those also discourage investment, that gridlock. Perhaps the biggest worry is whether we are training enough, whether we're training young people effectively to work in advanced manufacturing at all levels. Just this morning, the US Education Department released a disturbing report showing that Americans between the ages of 16 and 65 scored below the international average on literacy, numeracy, and problem-solving skills. Despite these worries, scores of companies have reshored some of their production in recent years. And we've seen some huge investments, such as the one from Global Foundries. I often write about the, the less high-tech industries. And one of the things that really impressed me recently was to learn that even though we've lost 99% of our shoe industry and people assume that we couldn't make footwear in the US anymore, there's now a Chinese company that is going to make work boots in Tennessee because they figured out that that's the better way to serve the American customer and we actually could be competitive. But so far, these scattered investments have not been enough to really move the needle on our trade deficit and our employment data. Manufacturing employment in August showed virtually zero growth from a year before. Not exactly the hallmark of a resurgence. Now granted, today's manufacturing doesn't create jobs by the millions, but if you have a resurgence, you expect to see some growth in employment. Well, that was the August data. We don't know the September data yet because our dysfunctional government failed to produce the monthly numbers on Friday. <laughs> well, what we're gonna to try to do today is talk about the sorts of policies uh, that we need if we are going to truly have a resurgence in manufacturing at all levels. Um, so I'd like to start uh, by turning over the mic to uh, Joanna, who can talk a little bit about it from an educational point of view. Well, thank you. Um, before I start, I'd like to uh, just a couple of thank yous. First, to the Aspen Institute and to my new colleagues who you've just heard from, uh, both Lori and, and Tom, I'm sorry, Tony and Tom, who uh, I think have really set the stage beautifully. Um, second, to Global Foundries, to Ajit as well, Ajit Man Manoka, I'm not sure I pronounced your name correctly, um, as well as Mike Russo. Global Foundries has been very significant in our ability to really move the education dial in terms of preparing a qualified workforce. They're a huge partner, and they've been a real partner who has led the way in many of, of, many of the things I'm going to speak about. And third, um, in the room today as we uh, started, I saw that a number of the partners uh, with whom we are working from our community colleges, our four-year schools, as well as our business partners are here today, as well as K-12. Um, so much of what I'm speaking about is as a result of, of their work. So um, from the educational perspective, what is it that we are doing? Why is the State University of New York so concerned with advanced manufacturing? Why is this a priority for us? Well, if um, I, th I think you said it correctly, that there was a time when folks felt that this was a boring topic or was advanced manufacturing was really about factory work. If you had asked me that question a year ago, did I agree? I would have said no. A year ago, I would have said this was the wave of the future. Now it is the future. It is our current state. Advanced manufacturing is truly the growth industry that we all know about. Right now, if we're looking at having a stronger workforce here in the United States, especially in the STEM fields, we have to have a stronger education pipeline. 
We know that coming out of our K-12 schools, that only 40% of our students are actually college ready. If they come to college um, ill-prepared for school, uh, they're not going to graduate from our schools. We need more students graduating from high school and college prepared to succeed in the workforce. So what are we doing? Well, we're doing a number of things um, in terms of the education pipeline. We have partnerships with the National Science Foundation, with the New York Academy of Science. We receive a number of federal grants. We have a lot of initiatives underway, early college, high school, P-TECH, and I can go through them all. But at the end of the day, we really need a systemic approach to this challenge. It's not about programs anymore. We're a country that is program rich, but system poor. The State University of New York, which is why we are so committed, is so large. We have 64 campuses across the state of New York, from Long Island to the tip of the Canadian border. We're talking about a half a million students. If we are committed to this work of having a better educated workforce, we can move the dial. If we don't do this, if we don't commit to this, then who will? And so we are embracing um, this challenge. We are partnering with, it right now, more than 150 business partners across the state, including Global Foundries, who, as I mentioned earlier, really is um, leading the charge. And they similarly, like SUNY, are big enough to really say that if they are committed to this, others should be as well. Um, one example we have of um, really recognizing that this has to be about systemic change, not just another program. Again, lots of programs. Um, every, I would say every state in this country has a number of programs. But when we look at the STEM fields, we still rank 23rd out of the rest of the world, and that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable for New York anymore. Uh, the governor has made this commitment. The president has made this commitment. The chancellor of the State University of New York has made the commitment, and so have I. And so what we are doing right now, one of the most exciting things we're doing actually with Global Foundries is we have a partnership. We're calling it the SUNY Community College Consortium. We have all 30 community colleges. Now we're talking over a quarter of a million students. Now getting 30 community college presidents, and forgive me for the one that's in the room, but getting all 30 community college presidents to agree on a movie, uh, getting three community college presidents to agree on the selection of a movie would be quite the quite the challenge. Um, in this case, speaking to the, the data and the facts that have been spoken about this morning, all 30 of us got together, recognizing no one entity could do it alone, focused on advanced manufacturing, so that our campuses from, again, from Long Island, the middle of central New York, to the tip of the Canadian border, working together with the Manufacturing Association, the Center for Economic Growth, and many, many business partners working together in the field of photovoltaics, nanotechnology, optics, welding, and so forth. Now, right now, this first initiative, where all 30 are working together, we did receive a federal grant for $15 million. And that's really, that's nice. But it is not about the money. We really are working on building an infrastructure for the future. What happens when the dollars go away? In this case, we're looking at 3,000 workers, including returning vets as well as adults, who will be trained in the advanced manufacturing field and for whom jobs are waiting. But it is right now just the beginning. We know that the top 30 Fortune 500 companies have 130,000 jobs unfilled now. As we speak to our graduates, especially those who are pursuing STEM fields. They know that a meaningful career opportunity is waiting for them. We're committed to this so that we can see that every one of our students has an opportunity not only in advanced manufacturing, but in fields related to this so they can make choices. Thank you. Uh, David, I wonder if you could talk about this a little bit from your perspective at, at the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, what do we need to do to uh, really have the kind of resurgence in manufacturing that we want. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to start with the understanding that the broader public and the, the political folks in Washington reflect the broader public are used to thinking of uh, a manufacturing on the decline, this we don't make anything in the U.S. anymore kind of craziness, but also that uh, the world, particularly in the manufacturing sector, is more of an is more of a threat than an opportunity. The world is uh, is a scary place for manufacturing and we should huddle in and build up big walls and 
uh, and uh, not engage in trade and, uh, and all the rest. Um, part of it is changing around the public's understanding of what manufacturing is and where it's going. And part of it is taking advantage of our natural uh, advantages. Uh, uh, and I'll go into that further. You know, there is a great opportunity for the U.S. to leap not only resurgence in manufacturing, but leap forward into a leadership position. And to some degree, the world's thirsty for us to do that. Um, if you look at uh, just core components of global competitiveness, who would you rather be? Uh, how many countries have better access to natural resources than we do, including energy and water and other things? A few, n not many though. Um, how many have better demographics? Uh, not, not Europe, not China, and not Japan. Uh, how many have a greater history of entrepreneurship, risk-taking, development of new ideas? Absolutely none. I mean, we have the core uh, components of uh, a great economic resurgence and in particular a great manufacturing resurgence. But the question is, are we willing to do the hard things and really willing to get out of our own way and allow this to flourish in the U.S.? Now, you know, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we're the voice of business in Washington. And we deal with a lot of big macro issues, so that that's tends to be what I focus on. But um, let's look at the basic plumbing of our economy and how people make choices about where to locate manufacturing facilities. How about our tax code? Okay, not helpful. Uh, extremely uh, anti-competitive in the world uh, markets. Uh, how about immigration? You know, we have a big debate on immigration reform. The, the chambers. The, out at the forefront of a pro-immigration reform policy. Uh, as you know, in any of these universities uh, where we're training the, uh, you know, the future engineers and high-tech folks, one of the things we do is tell a lot of them to go away after they graduate. Um, how about, uh, we talked about education reform, both K through 12, higher ed, and most particularly post-high school um, skilled training that is incredibly lacking. Everywhere I go across the United States, I talk to manufacturing groups, they say they need welders. Mm. Why is, I mean, in an environment of high unemployment uh, and you can make a great middle class living as a welder, why is that going lacking? There is a disconnect between what happens at the end of high school and what employers need that isn't fully being uh, filled right now. Uh, infrastructure, obviously, uh, uh, is uh, we're woefully lacking our infrastructure investment. Um, and this is an area where we have problems on both sides of the aisle in Washington in terms of a commitment to do what we need to do to spend the money we need to spend to upgrade our investment. Energy policy. We talked about the great advantage sitting right there for us in terms of, uh, alternate, uh, in terms of uh, unconventional uh, oil and gas and the advantages that that could provide a manufacturing sector. And the manufacturing sector currently consumes something on the order of 30% of all of our energy output. The question is, are we going to embrace that? Or are we going to put in place policies that stifle it? I mean, how's the shale gas boom going in New York right now? Uh, oh, it, it's not, actually. Uh, now, I'm from Western Pennsylvania, and if you know what Western Pennsylvania was like 15 years ago, uh, and know what it's like. You know, now you see a revolution in terms of the economy there. Um, trade, again, are we open to trade? Are we willing to engage in free trade agreements? Are we willing to come to the world of trade with confidence? Or are we going to continue to put up impediments to, uh, to trade around the world? So, I mean, I think we as the U.S. Chamber come at this as optimists, and certainly I do. There's every reason we should have a manufacturing resurgence. There's every reason we should win in the world in this space. I think our question, at least politically and from a policy perspective, is are we willing to do that? Are we willing to get out of our own way and do the hard things we need to do to win? Okay. Dan, you're an expert on the semiconductor industry. How is the U.S. doing competitively in that industry, and what is the outlook? Um, Despite all the news to the contrary, the semiconductor industry is not based in China. Actually, China is a very small part of the uh, semiconductor industry. And uh, uh, today, about 40% of all the semiconductors made in the world come from American-based companies. And uh, 
that's body equal to Japan, body equal to Taiwan, body equal to uh, uh, Korea. So uh, uh, it's, it's not nearly as bad as you think. Now, it's, a lot of it is still manufactured in Asia, and if you look at where is it manufactured, you know, what China does is China assembles a lot of the products, right? So the ICs come from here, they come, they're designed here, they, they're made in Taiwan, go to China, the, the phones are designed here, you know, but China's assembling them, but you're not seeing that. And so, and in fact, this resurgence in manufacturing was pretty predictable. I, I was at, I was invited to talk at Semitech a few years ago at one of their conferences about five years ago, and I gave this presentation called Snapback because they had asked me to really go out on a limb, and I said that what China was doing was exactly what the Japanese had done, and that was uh, uh, to encourage job growth by having low exchange rates, low wage rates. And the low exchange rates ultimately will result in high inflation, which happened to the Japanese with a real estate boom, stock boom. It's happened to China, and now it's becoming a lot more manufactured, a lot more costly to manufacture in China. So what you, you see happening in China today um, is very similar to that, and you could predict it. And then what would come back would be the high value jobs in the United States, uh, the jobs for the designers, the jobs for semiconductor manufacturing, because those are the ones that, that require uh, really smart people, really well paid people to do their, their work. And, uh, uh, and in fact, you know, one of the, the education theme is just really great here because, uh, you know, to make smart things, you need smart people. And, uh, uh, and, and one of the things they asked me to talk about was what's the relative importance of the semiconductor industry here today? And I think people really don't comprehend the value that it provides because so much of it's given away due to Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. Moore's Law means that you get twice as many transistors for the same price every year, or you get, or, or, or every two years, or you get a reduction in price of 50%. If you were to put that in, in constant dollar terms, the semiconductor industry would be bigger than the, uh, the entire global economy. The uh, Kumi's Law, which says that we get about 50% increase in computing power uh, every year, uh, that comes as a result of Moore's Law for the same watts in. Um, has also benefited us. Well, those things kind of are, are big picture, top of the line stuff, but now when you come down to reality, um, the pharmaceutical industry, virtually every drug that's been invented in the last 10 years wouldn't be here today without low cost computing. Um, the Predator drones that, that the U.S. uses to have military dominance around, its, it's use of d databases and and, and, and knowing where to do, where to target, smart weapons, all this stuff would not be here without U.S. dominance in the semiconductor industry. The, uh, 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 and then we can talk about the stuff that we all see, because we see the Chinese-made smartphone that we don't realize that what's in it is mostly American content, that most of the value inside that phone is American content. So it's, it's, it's definitely a, uh, a very vibrant industry. And, uh, you know, when you come back to it, what do we need? Um, we need a, a lot of simple stuff. I don't believe, if you look at countries that have tried to subsidize their, their semiconductor industry, China tried to, Europe tried to, they spent billions and billions and most of it went for want. Because if you, you create a weakness in the companies when you do that, a lot of it's just simply removing barriers. Um, you know, a semiconductor plant generates about $10 million of revenue a day. And uh, um, um, in order to, uh, um, excuse me, about $10 million an hour, I believe. Anyway, it's, it's if the guy coming to per permit the place show, misses a day because he decided to go on holiday or something and he misses an appointment or whatnot, all that money's gone. And that makes it very difficult for the company. So one of the things that's made New York so great has been its ability to uh, really strip down a lot of these requirements and make it easy to do business here because if you do that. Another thing that we need to do in this country is make it easier to spend the offshore dollars here. Because if you're an American company <coughs> and say you have $100 offshore, 
You can buy $100 worth of things offshore, but if you try to buy, take that money here, you can only buy about $60. So as much as you might like to buy goods made in America, there's just an artificial price tag put on that for other American companies to buy from American companies. So, so the you, tax code you yeah yeah so so you have um, you have all of these things that that, that really hamper it. Um, so if you can you can get a government that removes its barriers if you if you get the the education issues fixed you can create a lot of jobs in this country, and a manufacturing job in semiconductors it's some of the research has indicated it creates about five jobs in tech. The work I've done indicates that it creates about 10 jobs overall. If you look at the places that it's gone, um, like, uh, you know, you go to these, I remember, you know, like Rio Rancho, New Mexico, it was a one stop light town. You know, today it's a thriving metropolis. It went from being the lowest income county in New Mexico, which is one of the lowest income states in America, to being the highest income per capita county in, uh, in New Mexico. Um, look around here, look at all the new building, look at the vibrancy that's occurred because of the investment that's come here from, you know, really great visionary companies like IBM and, and Global Foundries who, who, who uh, saw that there was real value that could be created here. Uh, and uh, so, so it's, it can be done. We can, you can create value in places like this, and uh, uh, America is uh, definitely a leader in semiconductors, and we need to stay a leader in semiconductors in order to protect our future. Okay. Eric, we've heard all about uh, the immense potential. We have all of the resources we have, uh, but yet how gridlock in Washington is preventing us from taking advantage of certain things. What is really the outlook for Washington, is it going to stay gridlocked at least until the next election, or do we have any hope of uh, reaching breakthroughs on tax reform, immigration reform, health care, any of the other vital issues? So that's the hard question. Okay, let me um, get there. I will get there. Um, let me begin by thanking Global Foundries and the Aspen Institute for the opportunity to spend some time with you. And, and on a personal note, thank you for giving me an excuse to get out of Washington where the conversation is, are you an essential employee or not? Um, so it's great to not be in that stew. Um, let me uh, get, um, kind of begin the answer by the glass half full positive kind of response, and then I'll get into some of the negative and uh, that will uh, directly address your question, and then hopefully end on a positive note. So on the positive note, I mean, you know, where we are in Washington in policy circles and on the manufacturing space is really better than it's ever been. I mean, you know, the conversation in Washington about manufacturing and manufacturing policy is more robust than I can remember it. Um, we're in a position as the association, as, as a sector, where we're constantly being asked by members of Congress on both sides of the aisle and the administration, what do we need to do to turn around manufacturing? What do we need to do to help? What are your thoughts on? How can, how can we really make a difference in this sector? That's a great conversation to have. And in all candor and all honesty, Five, six years ago, that was not on people's mind. It was, you know, well, manufacturing, again, it's a dying industry. We're not going to really worry about it. We don't make anything here. That's really fundamentally shifted. We're coming off of a manufacturing day last Friday where between six and 700 manufacturers opened their doors to students, all the way from middle school up to community college, to bring them in just to talk about what opportunities exist in manufacturing. There's an excitement about it. There's an interest about manufacturing. Good news is um, manufacturing as a sector pays about 22% more in benefits and wages than any other sector. So if you get into the sector, there's a really promising, positive future ahead of you. Um, a lot of companies, and I know um, especially in this part of New York, a lot of companies in the manufacturing space are actively working to educate their employees to make sure that they're in a place where they're able to meet the challenges not only of today, but of tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So it's a, an industry that can grow with an employee. So again, really positive stuff. The negative stuff, the glass half empty stuff, the reality of kind of where we are. So the manufacturing sector, we, the good news is, I guess as I begin this, you're thinking about the great recession of 2008, 2009. We lost about 2.3 2 million manufacturing jobs in that period. As the economy began to recover in 2009, 2010, manufacturers as a sector were disproportionately leading job growth, leading economic recovery. 
we were creating jobs at a really robust rate. Some of that, in all candor, was directly tied to the auto industry and the auto sector coming back. And that led you know, the sector as a whole and kind of pulled the sector as a whole with the economy as a whole out of the real kind of depths of the ugliness of 08, 09. The downside, and it was referenced before, the downside is job growth in the manufacturing sector has effectively been flat for the last 12 months. So down 2.3 million manufacturing jobs, we've created 500,000 jobs since the Great Recession. We're still down 1.8 million manufacturing jobs since 08, 09 and flat job growth in the sector since roughly May of last year. Now there's a lot of reasons that go into that. Some of it's, you know, the, the troubles of Europe, China slowing, Brazil slowing, but a lot of it's the signals that we're getting from Washington. Um, the gridlock, the partisanship, the deep, deep divide. I mean, you start thinking about kind of the reality of where we are in the last week to 10 days of, of brinksmanship, of gridlock, of partisanship. All that sends a signal to capital and sends a signal to, to job creators from Washington that, that pro-growth, pro-jobs policies is not what is top of mind. Instead of having a conversation about the list of things that, that Dave kind of ticked off on everything from immigration to tax reform, to health care, to reg policy, to energy policy, none of that is happening. We're at a place where it's finger pointing in, in politics. Um, my hope is, and again getting to your question, in, in trying to end on a positive note, Partnership can, in building a, on a comment Tom made in, in, in his opening remarks, partnership that, that we saw bring this facility to, to this part of New York between the state and the federal government and international partners has an impact and can make a difference. Partnership in Washington can have an impact and make, make a difference. And, and again, so I, my hope, in, in, and again, you know, coming from a manufacturing background, you can't look at a problem with a manufacturing mindset and not come up with a solution. And that's kind of where, where our head is, which is there is a lot of problems in Washington. But I think over time, the realities of, of really economic growth and job creation will drive middle ground. Now that may not happen in the next two weeks, but I think it'll happen in the next six to 18 months. Okay. Well, if we look at global foundries, we can see that uh, New York State set the table for this investment, provided a huge amount of uh, incentives. It set up an infrastructure of education, uh, especially in the nanotechnology area. Uh, it lured Semitech to this area. Uh, is that kind of activism something that is going to work across America? And if so, what forms should it take? Do you want to try to address that, uh, David? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think all the panelists have um, uh, views on this. I think uh, those kind of state level and local and local uh, level initiatives uh, can have a, a great uh, impact on making uh, making a particular place attractive to a manufacturer and actually to help make up for some of these other things I talked about, the dif difficulties that uh, companies in the U.S. might face. And certainly the federal government, uh, through various initiatives over the decades, uh, from their uh, research facilities to this new proposal uh, from the administration to have these pods of, of uh, research excellence, I mean, I think all that helps um, and uh, will uh, help to generate these communities of, uh, of high-tech advanced manufacturers. But I think, uh, again, I come back to over the long term, even if you create some little areas of success, uh, the fact of the matter is technology doesn't stick to a border. Technology flows around the world. Uh, and over the long term, what is going to drive decision-making uh, for companies in terms of deciding where it's going to be manufacturing? It's where the people are, where the resources are, uh, what the uh, you know economic deal with the government is, uh, and you know we're going to have to do the hard stuff to get there. Now it's hard, you know. The reason there's a reason why we haven't done comprehensive tax reform. Yeah, there there are winners, but there are also losers. Mm -hmm. So this is hard stuff. But I think over the long term, we we need to do the basic plumbing to keep keep companies uh, here. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, as opposed to an kind of an either or question, for me it's an and question. 
I mean, it's a yes, there's going to be a role and a critical role for driving partnerships at state, local, and federal level. But I think that's part of the answer. I think the other part of the answer is getting to some of the comments Dave made and some of the comments I made. It's about creating an overall economic environment that's going to drive growth and, and sending the right signals to capital. I mean, if you, you can get the state, local, and federal partnership to work, to bring in $15 million, to bring in $1.5 billion for, for a facility, but if corporate tax rates are at 35 percent and you can't hire people with the, the skills that you need and if you're burdened by environmental regulations and if you run into and just kind of tick off the list and if the economy is slowing and there's not going to be demand for the products that are potentially going to be made at the facility you're not going to you're not going to build the facility so it's it, it, it's both state and local but it's also kind of the, the overall environment in which federal policy either creates or discourages uh, economic growth. If, if I could, I don't mean to, if I could jump in, the one, one thing I, I, I do talk about this a lot and do come back to it is some of you know Andy Grove has been very, uh, uh, talked a lot about uh, emerging technologies and the need to keep them here. And I think we as business, one of the things we have to keep in mind is uh, if you get so focused on cost cutting and offshoring, uh, and he talks a lot about the semiconductor industry, about how if you um, chase, the, chase the cheap manufacturing all the time, you lose innovation too. I mean, the idea that you can keep all the knowledge here and build stuff somewhere else is essentially false because a lot of what you, the knowledge comes from is making things. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And yeah. uh, in the emerging technologies in a particular area, we need both business but particularly government policy to want to incentivize people to keep that here. Yeah. Right, one of the things you're seeing in the semiconductor industry as we got below 100 nanometers was design and manufacturing became recoupled again and it became much more important for them to be closer. So you saw, this is one of the things that's made Albany is just the natural forces in the industry as, as the two have wanted to be coupled again and also the cycle times and just the the sheer tyranny of if you're in a market like Qualcomm is, you know, with mobile phones where you have these six-month cycles, the closer you get everything else, the faster your learning cycles are, the better you're going to be. So the more you, it's harder to make it global. And I think from a, a government perspective, what I've seen looking at the different states that have tried to attract is they have to basically have a systematic view of the industry. It's not a do this, do that. It's, it's understanding the, the, the ecosystem of how it of how manufacturing works in their state and how they can attract jobs and and you know you know the old def I, I, the definition of a politician that I like is is one who gets money from the rich by uh, uh, and votes from the poor by promising to protect each from the other mm. and uh, um, uh, and the way they can really do that is is by creating jobs because it's jobs that keep get the votes and and how do you create the jobs you have to create the opportunities for the business to create them because government can't create all the jobs it needs those resources and can we really be a, a, a economy of services that does nothing but you know do legal stuff for each other and sell to each other and whatnot we need the manufacturing core is where you create the core value we regularly see states competing with each other for new manufacturing investments, offering sometimes very large packages of incentives, uh, and these will help to drive where manufacturing locates. Is that a healthy thing to have this competition among states with, for incentive, the biggest incentive package? Your Honor, I mean, it, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's natural, but it's probably not healthy. Uh, I mean, again, um, uh, I, I think a lot of states, rather than saying, I will give you X amount of money to build something in this location, if you focus on having, creating the best macro environment in your state uh, for business, you know, have good regulatory system, low tax rates, good regulation, you know, I, I, I personally think over the long term that's a better strategy. It's harder, takes longer, uh, but um, you've seen uh, you, you know, uh, Indiana in particular is is all about how they're better in business environment than Illinois, right? And they put up advertisements in Illinois about come over to Indiana. That's a, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. The, the Rust Belt states are no longer competing just with uh, China or Mexico. They're competing with their neighbors. 
Uh, one of the things that I kind of thought about in this space is you, you have that Indiana, Illinois challenge. So as capital is looking to make an investment, both governors and in both state state economic development groups are at the table. But the, the, the seat is also being filled by representatives of the government of Singapore, the government of China, and the government of France. Those conversations can get to, this is what we're going to do on corporate tax policy, this is what we're going to do on individual kind of, you know, uh, tax policy, this is what we're going to do on, on infrastructure, on land, on land use, on regulatory challenges, and on environmental standards. The federal government, the U.S. federal government, is not at that table. So the state of Illinois can say, we'll give you X on state income taxes. We'll give you Y on, you know, hey, we'll build a, a on-ramp to a freeway. Mm -hmm. The government of, of Singapore is saying, okay, well, here's what we're going to do on corporate rates. This is what we're going to do on housing. This is what we're going to do on, on inland waterways. This, you know, and it's just the conversation is just, and again, the federal government, our federal government, the American federal government is just not at the table in a meaningful way to drive growth here. So France, Singapore, perhaps China even might have an advantage over us in terms of that kind of incentive package they can offer, they can be able to offer a really national I mean, and oh, local yeah. package. And a simple thing like, I remember one of the fabs was being built in Singapore, right? The ship arrived in the middle of the night and the customs office was closed. Well, they called the head of Singapore and they called down, woke the guy up and he came down and got it through. Uh, Imagine that happening in the United States. <laughs> I mean, just not going to happen. <laughs> so, so one of the things uh, I, I wanted to say, I think that's true. And what's happening in other countries is certainly something we may marvel at. I think for the United States, though, certainly the issue in terms of immigration and tax and all of that's really important. But to your original question about whether or not what's happening here in global foundries or, and I would even say in Tech Valley um, in general, is this something that can be replicated elsewhere? Uh, people are looking very closely at the investments being made here now. And quite frankly, if we don't have the manpower, the answer is not likely, um, which is why we're so serious about investing in the education pipeline. Right now, right now, the challenges New York State is facing are the challenges the entire country is facing. The issue in terms of not having enough people who are college ready, recognizing that all of the, the jobs we're speaking about require a college degree, again, in the STEM fields. If you go to Nebraska, if you go to Tennessee, if you go to Kentucky, any, any part of the state, they're facing the same challenge. Uh, one of the things we speak about is if you need more people, looking at the demographic trends, there are no disposable people. We know that right now in New York State, between the age of 25 and 64, between the age of 25 and 64, only 40% of that population actually has a two-year degree or better. So if we want to have the manpower in New York or in the rest of the country that is going to be ready to take on all these jobs we're speaking about, then we have to do something about our education system. And it has to happen not only K-12, it has to be P-16, and, and to be really serious about it. Because otherwise, all these jobs will be filled by someone else, and companies will leave to go to other countries. The one thing I would, uh, you know, I always encourage uh, local business leaders to do is to really focus on their institutions of higher learning. So you live in Pittsburgh, I'm from Pittsburgh originally, you know, the economy there used to be uh, steel. Steel mills aren't around anymore. The economy there is almost entirely based on Pitt, Carnegie Mellon, to some degree Duquesne, and what's related to that, UPMC, the hospital system. Uh, so, and the economy is doing pretty well. Uh, and they're developing this ecosystem of startups and uh, bringing the finance in to keep people there after they graduate. Um, I, you know, the, I'm always surprised at the number of local business leaders I, or local political leaders I talk to who don't really spend time thinking about the local university or the, you know, the, there needs to be an intensely close working relationship between local political leaders, local business leaders and the universities to create these ecosystems like you see around Stanford, like you see in Pittsburgh, like you see in, uh, in other, uh, other places. Actually, I think this is one of the challenges Detroit has in terms of resurgence is other than Wayne State, they don't really have that downtown urban national university. Ann Arbor is too far away, you know, and so you know, how, what do you build around? But 
I, you know, a lot of localities give away those advantages. They don't even talk to the university presidents. And because, and your point is so good, so thank you for bringing that up, because again, this is a national problem. It's not just New York State. We are starting to cross those state boundaries. So we just recently went, and I hope you look favorably on it, we are going after a $70 million grant, but it is with the State University of New York, MIT, RPI. We are bringing together all of the regional colleges and universities because this is bigger. This is bigger than what any one entity can do alone. Yeah, one thing about, you, you brought up a thing about Detroit. What made Detroit the center of auto manufacturing, because if you go back to that time, there were auto startups all over the United States. Almost every town had one. What made Detroit so strong was it was a railroad hub. Mm -hmm. It was a railroad maintenance hub, so there were lots of mechanics that could build things and knew how to build things. So they had a natural advantage because they had the human capital to build out the railroads. If you go fast forward to Silicon Valley, what made Silicon Valley so strong is, is it's ringed with universities. And California used to have a really fantastic education system that was virtually free, which they've eliminated now, which I think is a real concern for California. But it was also ringed with airports. And so you could get in and out fast, and it had an open port. So, uh, but for semiconductors, airports are mm. far more important, and having reliable transportation in and out is, is, is a huge issue for that. And I think, you know, the poli politically, leaders in states need to, th in, in local areas, need to think about how they eliminate all those friction points to business, because that's what really makes it, it stay there. You know, if you look at yeah. Texas or Virginia, why it's sort of, surged and then went back. They tried that subsidy, we're going to write you a bunch of checks, and then after a while they go, well, we can't do that anymore. We have taxpayers that are not, and we want money back from you. It, it, then it started to evaporate and uh, companies went elsewhere. Yeah. You know, and the companies can always move, but the states can't. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> Texas can't go to Dresden or Albany. <laughs> right. President Obama loves to talk about advanced manufacturing, and one of his initiatives in that area is to try to create uh, up to 15 research institutes that are supposed to drive forward innovation in key areas such as additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Uh, he set up a, an institute in Youngstown, Ohio uh, over a year ago. and There may have been some small electoral consideration in that location, but it's also convenient <laughs> close to Pittsburgh. Uh, he's trying now to set, set up more of these research institutes which are funded partly by the federal government partly by the state and local governments, and partly by industry. Uh, and one of the areas where he wants to do this is in a, an institute that would focus on new materials for semiconductors. Dan, do you think that would be a helpful initiative, or is that going to be more money down the drain, as you talked about, happening in uh, Europe? Well, I, I hope it's not money down the drain. I mean, <laughs> we've already seen these centers of excellence work in the semiconductor industry because we have a long tradition of doing that going back to the 80s with the SRC, uh, which was the first really very aggressive relationship between business and universities. Uh, so, um, but on when you talk about just simply putting money into a place to do research in a university, if there's no coupling to the business, if there's no business model, it's, it's like having an engine with no transmission, no wheels. It doesn't go anywhere. and so. Uh, that's, that's where you really have the issues. And when we talk about semiconductors, you know, you can count on your hands the, the number of places in the world today that, that really are high-level, state-of-the-art manufacturing centers and, uh, in, in semiconductors. And we have, uh, well, we only have 50 states, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, you, can't, you, you couldn't have 50 semiconductor manufacturing areas. You could have, uh, 50 areas of excellence, you know, it, in fact, there's actually, there's, if you look at semiconductor equipment and you start to add in some of the supply base, there's actually 20 states in the United States where they have people working that are involved in the, uh, the semiconductor industry, and there's more than 30 states in which there's designer, people that are designing semiconductors working. So it, it's, it's diffuse in that way. But when you get back down to the high volume manufacturing, like what's occurring here at Global Founders in Malta, there's just very few places that that really happens. And, uh, you know, in, in inventing something in a place is, is great, uh, but doesn't keep the permanent advantage. I mean, 
Xerox Research Park, right? I mean, invented the mouse, invented the graphic user interface. I mean, invented, invented, invented. Didn't do Xerox a lot of good, as far as I could tell. It did us yeah. all a lot of good, but not Xerox. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, it was great that they did that, but uh, once knowledge becomes available, um, uh, it, it, you know, the, the criteria aren't, you invent it in Xerox, so it stays there. It, uh, you know, it goes around the world and you have to compete on the core issues of competitiveness. Mm -hmm. We like to open this up to uh, people sitting very politely here. Uh, any comments or questions from the floor? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, for your prior speaker, a prior speaker had said uh, something to the effect of, we welcome immigrants to come here, learn advanced two degrees, and then send them home. Well, we already have the women here, and then we stifle them in their ability to achieve these degrees. So I'd like to know what you're going to do to get the other half of the workforce up to speed. Well, I agree with you. I think that there is no need to import people when we have um, a viable workforce to our left and right. Um, I was speaking with some colleagues earlier today to talk about some of the initiatives in which we are involved. Again, this is a challenge across the country. And in our case, we are partnering with the New York Academy of Science as well as the National Science Foundation. And we're looking at a number of initiatives with our K-12 partners, bridge programs, STEM-focused early college high schools, P-TECH, which was recently funded um, from our governor. Um, but one of the approaches is to start as early as middle school. And in the case of, of one initiative we have with the, the NSF Foundation, we're not just talking about getting students interested that don't have any interest. We're talking about young men and women who are interested in the STEM fields and whose interest wanes very quickly by the time they get into high school. So what we're doing is with many of our graduate students, um, postdoctorate as well as um, master's level students, is they're serving as mentors to middle school students and they are in embracing with these students the love of science as well as math. Uh, one of the unexpected outcomes is that we have found that the adults, in this case the, the mentors, they have embraced their feels to such an extent that they're willing to provide this expertise really free of charge on their own time. And the students, not one of them, has chosen another field. Sounds like a great program. Yes, sir. Yeah, we see um, manufacturing of semiconductors like it has been done in um, Taiwan, Korea, other places, creating, as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, 10 additional jobs. And you can also build up a design ecosystem around that. So are there any programs in this area to take advantage of the uh, Global Foundries facilities to, to build design expertise, to build product expertise, to build the complete ecosystem that you need to be competitive in global markets. Who's gonna take that on? The irony of it all, the irony of it all is, is that the, uh, the design expertise is right here in America all over. In fact, anything that's designed anywhere in the world Odds are greater than 90%, it's going to be designed on a design tool made by a company from America like uh, Synopsys or Mentor Graphics. You know, so, so we, uh, but it's so diffuse we often don't see it. And then we get hyped into this mentality that, oh, all of tech is in, is in Asia, when in reality it's, it's not. But, but Dan, um, can, we, can we hope to uh, keep that? design expertise in the long term given the weaknesses in our STEM education? That's going to be the real fundamental issue and I think we, we have weaknesses in STEM education. We've defunded uh, people in, uh, that want to go into those fields. Uh, you know, we, we, the public university system is, is nowhere what it was and they tend to favor foreign students because foreign students pay a higher uh, role. So uh, there's, there's just a lot of issues like that. How do we get our best kids out of, out of school, especially, you know, 
we cut off half the women and, and almost half the women coming into, that would potentially come into tech and maintain America's leadership just because of the problems that you were talking about with, uh, with STEM and, and getting kids, getting young girls in middle school to stick with science and technology. And, um, and that's way beyond what I really know how to do. I just know it's, it's a fundamental issue that we have to address as a nation. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, we get all hung up on things like school vouchers and, <laughs> yeah, you know, not really the really important Joanna things. Joanna and her colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. I think over the years at this, um, people have been addressing problems with respect to STEM education doing some incremental um, changes, and that's not working. I think there needs to be urgency to overhaul, do some different approach. One of the things I have been part of, uh, this is at Finger Lakes Community College near Rochester, is to design a program where students are able to use tools and knowledge which would have normally required probably dozen or half a dozen calculus-based courses. So I have used uh, Excel spreadsheet or other software like LabVIEW to create numerical calculus apps, which I teach them basically from day one. And as a result, we are able to do things without having to have those calculus courses. So if you look at the graduation rate for STEM education, especially engineering and technology across the country, it is something like 20% after say, six years of college. We cannot afford to do that. Uh, and part of the reason, I believe, has to do with people running into a wall right in the first couple of years with respect to quantitative courses. And that needs to be, we need to try doing some other things. Uh, our program is working in the sense that uh, we partnered with over two dozen high-tech businesses across a whole spectrum of high-tech industries, not focusing on a single business or single industry. Uh, the reason is, I believe, that most of the educational programs are geared towards um, large industries, and to me, it is almost like mass education. We all know the phrase long tail. So we have a whole bunch of smaller businesses with 50 people or less. Their needs are very unique. They cannot be addressed by mass education. So what we do, we require students to do co-op work, partner with each uh, student, with each business, whereby they are learning a lot of things which are important for that particular business. Even if they were to choose to go to another business, they are now knowledgeable about that industry segment. So that is the kind of model we need to replicate across the country. Otherwise, we are not going to solve this problem if we can keep doing the things we have been doing, and that's not going to work. With respect to uh, including women in the education, currently I have a student who is 17 year old doing her senior uh, class, finishing senior year at Victor High School, which is nearby, and she is pursuing this new curriculum full time. And she is actually helping some of the older students in the classes. So this can be done. It is not something we cannot solve, but there needs to be an entirely new way of approaching this problem. So you, um, you hit on one of the kind of key backbone issues that, that we really struggle with as the business community, as the academic community, and, and, and as the kind of policymaking community in Washington. We've known for the last 15, 20 years the realities of what we're facing. We're not getting the STEM education. And we're not getting the qualified employees to meet the day-to-day -day expectations and demands of the 21st century. What we're finding as we scratch the surface on this is there's a lot of real success stories. There's success stories, uh, you know, kind of down the path that, that you're talking about. There are success stories in Texas, in Ohio, in Indiana. Go through the list. At the governor's level, at the state level, at the city level, there's a lot of really great work being done. But it never translates into meaningful, broad-based, systemic change. What we're, so I'm, 
Our board of directors, which is a fairly big board of 250 members, met last week. And at that meeting, our, the chairman of our board, Doug Elmer Hellman from Caterpillar, put together a 12, 15 person member uh, kind of task force from our board, CEO level, to really look at and try to drive, we think messaging may be one of the backbone issues here, and, and problem identification may be one of the backbone issues. So you start, again, trying to kind of take the next step. If you scratch the surface on this, everybody has an answer, and everybody has a different problem. Some manufacturers will say the problem is I can't find qualified workers to take the baseline manufacturing job. 600,000 manufacturing jobs are currently unfilled because the business community of manufacturers can't find qualified workers. So some begin the conversation saying that's the problem. Some begin the conversation saying I've got people in place that are a great workforce, but my product makeup is going to change within the next 12 to 18 months. How do I train and retrain the existing workforce to meet the needs of the next generation kind of manufacturing product? And then you've got kind of that third level, which is that STEM, you know, the, the engineering, higher ed, you know, really kind of PhD level, advanced critical thinking and, and, and skill set, which gets into that PhD level. And, and, and so everybody, so in a very simplified way, three very different problems. And then you get to conversations about solutions. Some will say the solution is we need to change the a view of the American parent on manufacturing. That parents believe manufacturing is pouring steel into the three D's, dirty, dark, and dangerous. <laughs> exactly. Pouring steel in Pittsburgh in 1962. And my, I do not want my kids to go, and then there's a lot of concern that teachers have the same worldview, that manufacturing is dirty, dark, and dangerous. It's a bad thing. So you've got that. Then you've got kind of, okay, um, uh, there's a lot to this. Okay, so then, so some, so then, so some will say, okay, look, the problem is the programs aren't working. The federal government, through the w Workforce Investment Act, the kind of backbone federal program that sends federal money to kind of state and local levels, that that's fundamentally flawed and that the structure is wrong. So again, you, you, so what we're thinking about doing is how do you identify issues in a more clean way? How do you unify around two or three kind of major asks as opposed to right now? Each company in this room probably has a different ask for their specific business needs. Each academic representative in this room probably has a different answer to the underlying question. We've got to get to a place where we're going to Congress and the federal government with one ask, with one mission, with one goal. So again, a long-winded, and I apologize, you hit a lot of, and it gets all shut up now, but it, um, this is, I think, one of the key issues, because one, in one of the things that we're really focused on, and it's getting to a comment that was made earlier, and I'll just I'll, I'll stop with this. Certification is one of the key issues. If you're a manufacturer, you want the ability to say, look, I know if I hire this person, they've got the ability to do the job for which I'm hiring them. Too often, we're finding ourselves in a situation where people are hired, and it takes three, six, nine months of basic training to get them able to do the job. So that is a huge ramp up and a huge cost sink that people are putting into manufacturing jobs. The response has been, I'm not gonna hire a person on a long-term basis, I'm gonna outsource. I'm gonna hire a temporary worker or I'm gonna outsource. I'm not going to, so it really disincentivizes job creation. So again, there's a lot there. I'm sorry for rambling as much as I did. But the underlying issue is problem identification, solution identification, those two questions, there's a thousand different answers. What, what kind of uh, experience have you had on uh, your students getting jobs when they come okay. out of your school? Well, the first group graduated last May. There were nine people, and eight of them are working full time for the partner companies. I have in manufacturing. Yes, uh -huh. advanced manufacturing. Of the 14 sophomores, seven have started working for the companies because I scheduled the sophomore year classes to start after three in the afternoon. So after they complete the required co-op, they can start working. My policy suggestion would be to make it easier for the company to hire co-op. It is a low risk proposition, so give them tax break if need be. When a person goes, demonstrates what they can do, not just technically, but as a person, whether they fit into the culture of the company, there is a very good chance that they stay on. Every single person who has done co-op have been asked to stay the company where they finish the co-op. 
So that is very straightforward, something that can be done. Uh, second thing would be to provide more uh, tuition assistant or scholarship to people who are in the academic programs, students who are in academic programs, uh, which are solely needed, so that they are not working part-time or full-time doing some other job unrelated to the curriculum and not having enough time to do well with the program. So those two simple things can go a long way, and I, I don't think that the needs are same. They are different across the country. Each region needs to assess what the needs are within the region, work with the high-tech businesses. Another important uh, component is local uh, business organization. I work with FAME, Finger Lakes Advanced Manufacturing Enterprise, and we try to uh, be, do events to improve the image of manufacturing, as you are talking about. The other important part is local <coughs> economic developer. They have a lot of knowledge about what is going on, along with the workforce development. So all of this group need to sit down, work together, and that can be replicated across the country. I think there is, and I have students from 17 year old to people over 50, so it can be done. Okay, good, thank you, that's a good example. Sir. Yes, thank you. Eric, I think you're right on. The, there's a lot going on, mm. <laughs> a lot more than people, I think, realize who aren't in this room or in this sector. But thank you very much for coming. And I also wanted just to thank a lot of the people here. Well, you have academics, you have business leaders. I'm sitting next to Linda from the utility company. Um, we've had a lot of stuff going on here in the last couple of years, and I think that's evidenced by just that, that you're here. What we've always been challenged with is bridging the gap between where we are today and where we're going tomorrow. Uh, the effort that you see here is probably about 20 years old, uh, somewhere in that range, maybe a little bit less than that. And some of us have been here since the beginning of that effort. We've tr always tried to find what are the executable steps that we can take as business leaders, both local business leaders and as international business leaders and academics and pretty much everyone in the room. What are those executable steps that we can take to help keep this moving? Because whether you're thinking in a two-year cycle or a four-year cycle, Unfortunately, that's the elected cycles. What do we need to do to convince those who control our policy and convince those who control our pocketbooks to invest in infrastructure here today? Just some examples, if you can think of, you know, what do we need to do on the ground, day to day, not necessarily at the 30,000 foot level, but down here on the ground for those who try to enable this to continue to happen? Well, I, I mean, I, I start, um, again, I'm at the US Chamber. You've, you've uh, uh, great chambers here in the uh, in the region, including some of the representatives here. Um, you, you know, you have to start with the business leaders, politicians, and academic leaders have to be cheek to jowl on this on the same page. And I'm again always I don't know about the situation here, but I'm always amazed at the number of uh, localities where that doesn't happen. You know, where the mayor said, "Well, I saw the university president something three months ago," but I mean, they should be, they should, <laughs> you need business leaders and political leaders and academic leaders who are communicating constantly around a common set of, uh, of strategies in terms of uh, what can each of them bring to the table to help drive local economic development. And I think you've seen that in places, um, and that's where you've had the success. And somebody, be it the political leaders or the business leaders, has to drive those constant uh, conversations. It's not going to happen randomly. It's got to be a disciplined effort to say, we're all in this, we care about this region, we're all heavily invested here, we've got to make it a success. And that's not hard, that's just talking to begin with. I would add two comments um, very quickly. Um, there's been a massive churn in the House of Representatives in the last two cycles. You think about the, the sweeps in 2010 and the, and the kind of extension of that in 2012. You've got 37% of the House is either in their first or second term of Congress. So you've got, call it ballpark, 100 members of Congress who as early or as recently as eight months ago were a dentist. They were a trial attorney. They were, okay, so you begin a conversation with them about international competitiveness. They don't know what you're talking about. So get them into your manufacturing facility, spend time with them, give them kind of the basic 101 of what it is that, that you're really facing. Because for a lot of them, they just have no idea. Not, not necessarily their fault, they were a dentist six months ago. The idea of meeting a 
well, they are, we should have met a payroll, but it's a very different environment in the healthcare space. So it's, you know, get, get them exposed. But then two, one of the things that we're struggling with in, in Washington, and you're seeing it to some extent in, in the ongoing fights over the last couple of weeks, members of Congress don't necessarily view business competitiveness the way they did five, 10 years ago. They don't begin the conversation saying, what is the best interest of job creation? And, and what is the best interest of economic growth? They begin the conversation with, and again, this is on, on both sides of the aisle, what is the politically expedient and politically popular thing to do? That then says, as you kind of think about, you know, getting involved in, in, in elections and getting involved in primary discussions, more times than not anymore, there's a binary choice on both sides. There's a generically business-friendly candidate and there's a generically unfriendly business candidate on both, you know, in both primaries. And what we're finding is that, you know, at the federal level, we're getting a lot of members of Congress coming to Washington with a very different agenda and a very different goal. They're not coming to Washington saying, my job is to create an environment to drive growth and drive economic development. They're coming to Washington saying, my job, why I got elected here, is to repeal, repeal Obamacare. That is the only reason I'm here. It's what I ran on. It's what I told my constituents I was going to do. And my constituents elected me to do this. So I'm going not only through the wall, I'm going over the wall, around the wall. And if there's a cliff on the other side of it, I'm going to jump off the cliff. So they begin the conversation in that way, right? So we, you know, as a result, end up in kind of this, this mess because, again, too many members are just beginning the conversation in a way that we're not. So that, I mean, the responsibility is also on us voters to uh, elect some more pragmatic people. Uh, thank you so much uh, to members of the panel here and to the audience. I'm going to turn it over to Tony again. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic conversation, and I think we uh, really just began to lay out a very rich and engaging landscape. Let me just try, if I can, briefly to summarize a couple of key takeaways. And as I framed the com our opening remarks, um, I want to underscore this is the beginning of a conversation with all of you in this room. And uh, I look forward to a constancy of conversation and engagement with you. But what I heard today in, in, from the panelists uh, and also from some of the Q&A is the following. There's a granular partnership that is evolving in uh, upstate New York on multiple levels. And what we have to do is figure out an action plan to deepen that partnership. And uh, I think one needs to acknowledge that Global Foundries uh, engaged in a very extraordinary partnership, one of risk taking. And um, I think that they have looked at a scenario in which um, they are embracing here in Tech Valley, as you said, Joanna, uh, a multiplicity of uh, engagement on many different levels to create win-win scenarios. Um, uh, I think, Dave, you talked about, and I will, full disclosure, I too am from Pittsburgh, so this was a, a heavy Pittsburgh-dominated, uh, and go Pirates. I know uh, my husband is a Red Sox fan, so, um, and I know in New York that's a little tricky, but um, I, I think in, I can say that given where we are with um, uh, uh, the playoffs. But dirty, dark, and dangerous. What I heard from the panelists is, right economic environment, right education commitment, and right philosophy here in Tech Valley in terms of embracing risk-taking risk entrepreneurship and collaboration with multiple stakeholders. With regard to our climate in Washington, for one who worked on Capitol Hill and also worked in an administration, I leave it up to those in Washington, and I hope, as Bob said, it is incumbent on all of us to engage with um, those players in Washington and our local officials, because I remember that all politics are local, and we do need to remain engaged. But with that, I'd like to thank everyone, and especially our, our uh, distinguished hosts and colleagues from Global Foundries. Thank you very much. <laughs>